Hello, I'm Danielle Boko of Toronto Bureau Chief for Bloomberg. On behalf of Bloomberg, I'm extremely pleased that you could join us for the second session of the Bloomberg Canadian Fixed Income Series. The Canadian Fixed Income Conference is the eighth annual event of its kind. It brings together the biggest names in Canadian bonds, credit and commodities markets. 2020 is not a normal year, as I'm sure some of you have noticed. And to deal with that, we have turned our usual full day of presentations uh, into an six virtual briefings. The, the first one kicked off last Monday, and I'm hoping very much that everyone who's watching today is going to check out the agenda section of the website for more information on what's still to come. Today, we're going to take a look at several important Canadian industries, including mining, telecommunications, and real estate. The common denominator, of course, with all of these uh, is the way that Canadian firms are adapting to the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we kick off with the mining sec segment, I want to thank our sponsor, National Bank of Canada, for helping to make this virtual event possible. And we also have a few housekeeping announcements to make sure that everyone can enjoy the program. If you have technical problems, which hopefully nobody will, but please try refreshing your browser. That's the number one tip. Or use the chat box in the bottom right corner of your screen for tech support. And you can also submit questions uh, to our speakers during the interviews. And I'm going to try to get through as many of those as we can. To do that, you want to click open the white tab on the right hand side of the video window, type your question. And if you include your name and where you are writing from, we will give you a geographical or, uh, or audio shout out as well. It's not required though. Anonymous questions are fine. Um, we hope that you're going to engage with us on social media. To do that, you want to use hashtag Bloomberg CFI. That's all the housekeeping. I'm going to welcome Mary Scott Greenwood now, the CEO of the Canadian American Business Council, to kick our session off. Thank you, Danielle. You know, throughout history, people have been engaged in commerce with each other. Uh, it's a fundamental element of human society. If you go back a couple hundred years even, when the U.S. was a brand new startup of a country, most nations traded with each other and most engaged in very costly tariff wars. It was here in the new world that a new kind of trade emerged, tariff-free commerce. The modern story starts in the 1940s, actually, when Canada and the United States decided to have free trade in, of all things, tractors, agriculture equipment. 25 years later, our two countries enacted the Auto Pact of 1965, which was a foundational free trade agreement for the modern era. You know the rest of the story, NAFTA, now USMCA. Together with Mexico, we have created the most prosperous commercial relationship on Earth over a trillion dollars in economic activity a year. It's $144 million of trade each hour, every day. Every once in a while, there's a hiccup in the commercial flow, as we all know. The most recent example, the U.S. aluminum tariffs levied against Canada have thankfully been removed for the moment. But in a bit of irony, the U.S. is currently advocating for quotas and managed trade in aluminum, while Canada is advocating for the free market. If you were to reverse or switch out aluminum for dairy, the positions would be reversed. In the current environment with the pandemic and the economic fallout from it, it is more important than ever that our countries work together on recovery. That's why together with the Quebec Delegate General in New York City, we, the Canadian American Business Council, have launched a grassroots effort called the North American Rebound Campaign. And the idea is to convey to policymakers that we are all in this together that the solutions should be collaborative, not competitive with each other, between governments, between jurisdictions. We are pleased that the U.S. Chamber, the National Bank of Canada, the National Manufacturing Association, and so many others are joining in this effort. And since you will be hearing from some of the great leaders in the mining industry today, let me also flag an initiative that we are working on that the Council has been thinking about for a couple of years, bilateral cooperation on critical minerals and rare earths. Given Canada's expertise in resource extraction, its strong environmental standards, and its port and railroad infrastructure, we feel that Canada, not China, could be the world hub of processing and production of critical minerals and rare earths, which are found all over the globe, but only processed really in two places in the world currently. Critical minerals and rare earths are used not only in commercial goods like iPhones and electric vehicles, 
but also in defense goods like precision guided missiles. The U.S. defense community doesn't want to be reliant on a Chinese bottleneck. Herein lies a great opportunity for Canada-U.S. collaboration. If Canada provides certainty around permitting and the U.S. provides a guaranteed market of sorts, surely there will be enough private capital to stoke this initiative. Governments are already talking about the art of the possible, but if we move at the pace of government, it could take a while. Former Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis had an important column on this topic in Bloomberg just last week. I encourage you to check it out. Regardless of the outcome of the U.S. election and whenever Canada has an election, we are in this together. We need to collaborate together as North America. And with that, I'm pleased to turn the program back over to you, Danielle. Thank you. Thank you very much to Mary Scott Greenwood. Let me now introduce our first panel of the day. Uh, we have got Ben Lamb joining us. He is the Vice President and Treasurer of Agnico Eagle Mines. And Carol Banjucci is the Executive Vice President and CFO, Chief Financial Officer of I Am Gold. So we're gonna start. Um, thank you both, first of all, very much for joining us today for our virtual session. Uh, and I think that we have to, although this is a fixed income conference, I think we have to start uh, with a question on the markets for both of you, because obviously the overall market conditions during the COVID-19 pandemic um, have been extraordinarily volatile. Gold miners have been benefiting the most. Um, gold is off its recent peaks, but we're still at close to all time record highs around $1,900 an ounce. So I would like to start by kind of framing our discussion today with your expectations for the rest of the year and into 2020. And, and I'm gonna start with you, Ben Lam. What kind of assumptions is Agnico making about the, the longevity of the gold rally and just the outlook overall for interest rates? Well, thank you, uh, Danielle, for having me. Um, I think in terms of uh, gold price, obviously, we've been around here at Agnico for over 60 years. So we've always prided ourselves on taking a very conservative approach. You know, we do understand that we are in a very volatile industry. Um, but, uh, but, you know, as we continue to move ahead with our planning, we're actually currently in the midst of our planning process, our life of mine process. You know, we are still using a fairly conservative gold price, um, you know, somewhere in that twelve to $1,300 range um, for our long-term planning. So, you know, I think that really is the difference this time around from the last bull cycle in the gold, uh, uh, in the uh, gold market. Um, you know, for the most part, us miners are, us producers are taking a very conservative approach to our long-term planning and really with the with the goal of building up a strong foundation that can withstand the market volatility that's expected over the coming uh, months and years. I, I want to mention we're bringing in our, our third panelist now. We had a few technical problems off the top. Raman uh, Rontawa is the Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Capstone Mining. So we've got three people on board now. Um, Raman, just to catch you up, I was talking about general market conditions and I, I'm actually going to ask Carol to pick up um, on, on what Ben was saying. So many of the miners that I've talked to in the last year have been very conservative in, in terms of the gold prices that they're using. At what point do you start to have some confidence that maybe these higher prices above $1,500 gold are actually gonna hold? Yeah, good morning, Danielle. Good to be here with you this morning. I mean, it's been a pretty challenging environment. You know, obviously we're living through uh, unprecedented times. We're all working through the difficulties of COVID. Uh, certainly, um, everyone's paying attention to the political environment in the U.S. with the uh, with the uh, pending elections, and, and I think, uh, like many of you, I'll be watching the uh, debates, uh, the first presidential debate this evening. Um, you know, there's social justice issues that we're all kind of faced with, and you know, continue to look at what's going on with the U.S. and China. Uh, Canada often falls sort of in between the two of them, and that was certainly the case with Huawei. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're certainly living through some really challenging times and uh, uh, with the you know, massive deficits being ac accumulated with uh, a, a fiscal stimulus being provided, um, you know, to the market. And so, you know, so with that backdrop, you know, certainly it's very conducive to uh, a high gold price uh, currently where, you know, as you said, it's trading around 1900 uh, close to it this morning. Um, we expect that that will continue and, and perhaps even get stronger. Um, but, you know, to your question, similar to, to what Ben said, we're, we are really managing our business very conservatively. Uh, our reserves are being done at, at 1,200, our, our resources at 1,500. 
uh, our budget for next year, we're using 1600 and we do run, you know, various sensitivities, but, you know, we saw the gold price drop a hundred dollars last week. And so uh, I think, you know, it's a volatile market. I think that will con continue uh, into the future. And uh, at, here at IM Gold, we are going to be very conservative and making sure that we deliver margins to, uh, to the business and, and, uh, and to our shareholders. All right, and, and same general broad market question to you, Ramon. You're in a slightly different um, position than Ben and Carolyn that Capstone gets most of its revenue from copper and the trend obviously for copper since April has also been up, but you know, copper prices are not even back to the 2018 peak, much less the 2010 peak, whereas gold we've got at, at all time record highs. So it's a little bit different. What, what's your outlook? Yeah, I mean, Copper, as you indicated, uh, copper had a bit more of a bumpy ride with COVID-19. Initially, when COVID happened, just like many other industries, copper is a barometer of the economic health of the economy globally. Um, and copper dropped from like 275 down to about 220. So unlike the gold miners, we had different uh, measures to put in place with cost reductions and managing our balance sheet uh, through a low period. And as you said, I think I think it was a little later than April, but then copper started to rebound and it has, as Carol mentioned, it's been pretty volatile, right? So it's gone from a low of 220, 230 up to $3 copper. So copper's moved down 20, 30% and then up past where it was pre-COVID. Um, and, and really when you look at the outlook on copper, we're gonna manage our business conservatively, just like every other miner. We run our reserves at 275. Uh, we run our planning at 275 um, and then do sensitivities. But at the same time, when you look at the copper outlook, we're bullish now on copper. Copper's had, as you mentioned, had that little peak there in 2018, but really the last five years have been under $3 copper. Um, and when you look at why be bullish copper now, not from a planning perspective, but just from a general market perspective, the stimulus required um, post COVID-19 um, in terms of infrastructure spending to get the economies back going is backed by copper. And China's already leading the way, given they came out of COVID-19 first. And China consumes 50% of the world's copper. So that's a good indicator. I'd say one, stimulus programs. Two is green electricity. So solar and wind and electric vehicles. Um, copper is the main component. So as we look to take out CO2, copper is going to be a key component over the next few years here. And then the electric vehicle revo um, revolution. So as that takes off, copper will take off. So. The outlook, I believe, on copper now is set up to have a good five years or more um, after it's been down for a while. Okay. So, okay. so, you know, if I summarize, kind of wrap all of that together, all three of you, there's a lot of common ground here. All three of you have got, uh, you know, nice tailwinds coming from your underlying commodity prices. Fundamentals are looking good right now. You're all focused on managing your businesses conservatively, nevertheless. And the third part of the equation, which is really the, the focus of this conference, fixed income, you know, the backdrop is rock bottom interest rates. So let's dial down a little bit into each of your companies. Carol, I'm going to start with you because you could certainly argue there has never been a better time to refinance debt or to take on new debt. And you guys, I am gold, actually took advantage of market conditions to refinance um, earlier this year. Tell us a little bit about what that process was like and if there are plans to do more. Right, um, and well again, thanks Danielle. We actually accessed the high yield market two weeks ago and uh, we raised $450 million. And I will say with, you know, the support of the central banks, you know, we've had a you know, well-functioning market. So we were able to access the market. Um, it, you know, the focus was to refinance existing bonds um, that had a coupon associated with it of 7%. And uh, and uh, mature it was maturing the bonds were maturing 2025. Uh, we refinanced at five and three quarters, and we moved the maturity out to uh, 2028. So, you know, we were very um, opportunistic. Uh, it made sense for us to do that uh, because the markets, like I said, are, are you know very deep and well functioning. Um, and what that does for us, it, it allows uh, us to support the you know our needs because we're embarking on a uh, major construction um, of a, uh, you know, it's a world-class uh, asset in, in Canada. And so making sure that we've got, you know, a robust balance sheet to allow us to, uh, you know, underpin our business strategy was really key to us. So, you know, we we're really pleased. We we're well oversubscribed and uh, just very, very successful outcome for us. 
Yeah, you're, you're talking about Cote, obviously, is the project, and, and I'm going to ask you a little bit more about that later on. But just the second part of my question, you know, are you tempted to borrow more? I, this is a question I want to ask everybody, just given that the conditions right now in the market are so unique, even if you don't right. need to, want to. Yeah. You know, we, you know, we're sitting with $800 million of cash on the balance sheet. We have access to a $500 million credit facility, which is vir virtually undrawn. So, you know, we're, and, and now we've refinanced the bond. So we have an exceptionally strong balance sheet. And it, uh, you know, when you compare it to our peers, you know, we are, you know, we're in net uh, cash position. Uh, so we don't have any needs to access the markets any further. I mean, one of the things about being in the gold space and, you know, be just being subject to the, the volatility around the, uh, you know, the commodity price, uh, it's really important to have a strong balance sheet to be able to weather that volatility. Uh, and that's historically something that we've all always operated with. And so, and that will continue. So we really feel you know, that we're fully funded, well financed in order, in order to execute on our business strategy. So we're not anticipating um, accessing the market any further, uh, just based on our current sort of outlook. Um, we are, you know, amply cashed up. And uh, and again, again, being able to access the market uh, two weeks ago, you know, was just something that uh, was important to us, and it proved to be very successful for us as well. I also sit on the board of a copper company. They also came out uh, around the same time with a similar type of experience. So I think those that you know wanted to, to access the market are taking advantage of the current environment to do so. Um. Ben Agnico sold two hundred million dollars in debt in March, which you know even further back, right at the the sort of peak volatility, middle of the market mayhem. Nobody knew at that point what was going to happen. Were you not tempted to delay in the middle of all of that? <laughs> um, well, Danielle, there was certainly a lot of uh, discussion. There were a lot of uh, evenings, late night discussions as to do we go, do we uh, uh, stand back. Um, but as you mentioned earlier this year, um, Ignika, we actually decided, uh, uh, similar to uh, Carol and I am Gold, to refinance a portion of a debt maturity that we had coming due in April of, uh, of, of this year. So we had $360 million coming due. Yeah. We actually decided, given the market conditions at the time, to uh, refinance it, refinance $200 million of that uh, debt maturity um, at what was at that time a very uh, uh, good time to access the markets. Um, so as, as you mentioned, Danielle, you know, as we were about to price up a deal at the beginning of, um, of March, um, we literally lived through that, uh, at least the beginning of that volatility in, in early March as treasuries went from about 140, 140 basis points, all the way down to 90 basis points when we actually ended up pricing a deal. So um, as we all know, you know, that eventually continued to go down to 50 basis points. Um, and I'm going to point out, obviously, that was an all-time record low for U.S. Treasuries. Um, so, you know, as you can imagine, there were a lot of sleepless nights. Um, there was a lot of discussions whether we stand back or go ahead with the deal. But at the end of the day, um, you know, as I said earlier, we've been around for over 60 years. Um, you know, we have all been experienced, uh, have experienced living through these volatile market conditions. And we took a step back and really looked at the backdrop that we were issuing this, uh, this, uh, th this debt in. And that was virtually record low U.S. Treasuries, um, very strong uh, credit spreads for miners at the time. And we ultimately printed a coupon of 2.83% for an average maturity of, uh, of 11 years in the U.S. private placement market. So I think it really, despite all of that volatility, we really took a step back and looked at what was a record low for Agnico in terms of a coupon. And we said, you know, that is, uh, you know, you certainly can't go wrong with issuing 11-year uh, paper at 2.83%. And are you done now? Um, yeah, I think, you know, we certainly are, you know, we actually repaid 160 million earlier this year, um, you know, in this type of gold in, uh, gold price environment and with the ramp up of our, uh, our, uh, our new mines, um, you know, we did bring into production a couple of new mines up in the Canadian Arctic last year, um, you know, those mines continue to ramp up and are expected to perform really strongly in the second half of this year. Um, so given the current back, uh, gold price environment, given the expected strong cash flow generation, um, I would say, you know, unless there is some sort of a surprise, 
um, you know, we are comfortable with uh, with our uh, with our balance sheet currently. Okay, and what would a surprise constitute? Well, you never know. You know, as as, as we all know, uh, it is uh, it is a volatile industry. Um, there's always opportunities to continue to grow the pipe pipeline, but we are very comfortable with the current pipeline that we have. You know, we are well funded to advance that pipeline. Um, so barring uh, a, a major surprise, M&A or otherwise, you know, you can't really plan for that type of stuff. Um, you know, we are, we are, uh, we should be set in terms of uh, our uh, capital structure and our balance sheet. All right. And I want to pick up on that in a second, but um, Ramon, I want to bring you in as well, because you guys are not in this market really right now. You have a revolver, but I think that's it. If the terms are attractive enough, which they would seem to be right now, would you be tempted to issue debt, to shore up your balance sheet, to raise capital for projects, for for anything at all? How, how would you fund your plans going forward in this market? Yeah, I mean, it, when you look at ours, we have a 300 million revolver. Um, we've been approached obviously by banks, whether we want to replace it with a high yield note, given the markets are attractive terms. but. From our perspective, the size of the company with five to six hundred million of revenue, we, we're looking to kind of delever our balance sheet. We're net debt one sixty five, and if we can get a little lower with some creative, precious metal ideas, um, you know, we we can take that balance sheet. COVID nineteen's kind of showed us, you know, you want to be uh, a modest use of debt, and so we run our debt targets using lower copper prices than we say do our reserves at maybe two twenty five or. Uh, 250 in terms of what, what kind of debt levels we want in terms of our ratios. So I'd say we're looking not to take on more debt, but to kind of um, delever our balance sheet even a bit further if we could. Um, and then as we have some growth in front of us, like a project in Chile, a billion dollars CapEx or more um, in terms of fin financing that, there's different streams. You just talked about gold taking off. So that project has copper gold, iron ore. So the gold is worth, you know, a couple hundred million dollars there. Um, we can also look at project debt financing if required, but I mean, the high yields are obviously attractive. So we'd analyze all the alternative alternatives to see what debt structure makes sense for that project in the future. Yeah, and you're you're at a different um, place in the investment sort of spectrum right now, but Capstone has never paid a dividend. What What is the plan for free cash flow if copper prices hold around $3 or, or if they even improve based on all the the fundamental tailwind that you're getting that you talked about at the top of this. Yeah, I mean, if we look at our shareholder base, I, I don't sure believe any of our shareholders are a dividend uh, yield holder in terms of capstone. They're buying us for optionality to copper. They're buying us for optionality and expiration um, and the growth. So our, our our free cash flow is reinvested into our business units um, and into making sure the balance sheet is managed properly. So we believe that's kind of the best use of capital for us rather than paying a dividend. Okay, and and same question to you, Carol, because cash flow is obviously such a huge topic of conversation among gold miners right now, um, with lots of pressure to return more of the windfall to shareholders. Um, you, you've got the the huge spend for the Cote Gold project in Ontario this year. Where do you sit on the possibility of a dividend? Because I I don't think I am Gold has paid one since 2013. That's right, Danielle. Uh, you know, look at we. Uh, you know, as we look at our growth strategy, um, I guess. I guess first of all, let me say that definitely with you know current gold prices, uh, you know the gold sector overall is generating you know good cash flow, and uh, and a number of companies out there are paying a dividend. And you know, we're in a bit of a different uh, position right now. We've got this you know tier one asset that we're looking uh, to. Uh, to put into production, it's a 1.4 billion dollar U.S. spend. Uh, in the first, you know, it's it's got a mine life of 18 years plus. In the uh, in the first uh, five years of production, we're producing close to you know 500,000 ounces at 100%. This is a joint venture with Sumitomo, where we own 70%, they own 30%. Uh, it's it's a, this is a clear path to a real transformational change for IM Gold. Uh, we're going to go up from pr producing 700,000 ounces to over a million. Our all in sustaining yeah. costs are expected to be below 1,000. So for us, the priority is really around execution of this project because it's such a phenomenal opportunity for us and it really changes the game for I am Gold. But look, at if gold prices continue to rise uh, and we start to continue to, um, not start to, but we continue to accumulate cash, 
is something that we'll definitely have to take a look at. And it's definitely part of the conversation that we're having with our shareholders. Okay, and, and Ben, again, the, the same question to you, you know, the, the sort of comments that Carol was just making really remind me of similar comments that Sean Boyd was making a few years ago when you guys were ramping up the Nunavut operation. So you've come through that now. Um, you're at a really different place. You've got this amazing tailwind coming from higher gold prices. Do you send more of that to shareholders or do you look for the next big opportunity? Well, Danielle, it really is a combination of all of that stuff. I think uh, you're absolutely right. You know, coming out of uh, the construction bill and, and, and build phase that we're coming out of uh, in 2019, we're certainly very well positioned. And it is certainly at the forefront of a lot of our discussions. Um, Agnico, as you're likely aware, has paid a dividend for over 37 years. So it is a very important part of our business. Um, you know, we do value that this is uh, not just our company. This is also, the, we, we do have uh, owners who are looking to uh, benefit and participate in the current gold price environment. So that certainly is at the forefront of our discussions. We are very much focused on increasing the owner's dividend. Um, it is something that we're having a lot of discussions about, and certainly in a rising gold pricing environment and in the position that we are in, uh, the position to benefit from uh, uh, the increasing cash flows, we certainly would look to return a, a, a fair amount of that to our shareholders. But, you know, we also are uh, well aware that this is a long-term business. Um, you know, we do have to continue to reinvest in our business as well um, and continue to focus on growing that pipeline, developing that pipeline, um, and ensuring that that cash flow generation continues for many, many years. So it is finding that right yeah. balance, Danielle. It, it's a volatile industry, and you know we've been able to uh, to survive, and we've been around for over 60 years. And part of it is because we have been able to uh, to, to find that uh, uh, perfect balance in terms of capital allocation. But if the priority is protecting the dividend for shareholders, which seems as though it has been a priority for Agnico over the history of the company, really then as those huge opportunities come along, this, this sort of leads back to what you were saying earlier when we were asking about, when I was asking about what a surprise would look like. Um, I mean, are, are you guys looking for the next best thing? And, and if you are, would you fund it with debt? Well, you know, we're always uh, keeping our eyes open, Danielle. I think, you know, we wouldn't be doing our our, our, uh, our owners and shareholders, uh, we certainly would be doing them a disservice if we didn't look forward and continue to look for opportunities to grow that pipeline. I think uh, as we've demonstrated here at Agnico, you know, we have always taken a very balanced and measured approach to any M&A opportunities that, that, that do come up. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, the, the Agnico has, um, you know, we've done relatively small deals in our 60 year history. Only once have we done a significantly large deal. And that was back in 2014 when, along with our partners, Yamana, we, we acquired uh, the Canadian Malarctic mine. Um, so I think it is something that we always uh, uh, keep in mind. We do make sure that we do find that balanced approach, you know, certainly very, very uh, attractive cost of debt these days, but you know we certainly uh, uh, have to find that perfect balance, and we wouldn't do everything via debt if that opportunity did come up. The time has gone so quickly. I, I'm going to ask you all one last question around sustainability. There's actually a question from the audience asking whether the panel can talk about um, sort of the the impact of sustainability on operations and and i specifically um ben I'll, I'll throw this one to you first would like to know how much esg questions come up among fixed income investors because we know that equity investors really care about this in the gold space and it's one of the things that's that's helping sort of attract people generalist investors to certain gold companies what are you hearing from fixed income investors can give you each about 30 seconds yeah, no, it certainly is a very uh, important topic nowadays, you know, not too different from equity uh, investors. You know, 10 years ago when Ignico first uh, accessed the debt capital markets, um, it wasn't a very common question. But nowadays, it's a very important part of uh, our, our marketing. 
Um, you know, we do get asked a lot of questions because investors also have to do, do, do their own due diligence um, because they, in turn, are also asked the same questions from their investment committees and credit committees. So, you know, it is uh, it is become very important and becoming increasingly important. It's so certainly something that Ignico does a very good job of. Okay. Actually, I changed my mind because we're running out of time. I'm going to give you all a different question to end with. So, um, Rahman, I'm going to ask you about uh, your currency assumptions going forward, because both you and Ben have operations in Mexico, and you also have a presence in Canada. Um, means your costs are in those currencies. Gold, obviously, copper are denominated in U.S. dollars. So how concerned have you been about U.S. dollar weakness through the pandemic and potentially into the election? Um, I mean, it's hard to predict, as you as you can imagine. But when COVID nineteen happened, I, I can just tell you when we see opportune, just like Agnico, probably uh, times in the currency, you know, the Mexican peso and the Canadian dollars went the wrong way, and and for us, copper went crashing. But what we did was opportunistically actually hedge uh, the Mexican peso and the Canadian dollar to lock in some of those cost savings for years out, and fuel prices as well for our American mine, uh, just because you know you, you get these once and. A lifetime opportunities maybe to jump in at some really low cost and so you can never i guess technically project the currency markets but when you see a rate we really liked we got into the mexican like at 23 24 um so we're kind of happy with that strategy all right and carol we're out of time but i'm going to just squeeze in one very last short question um sort of on on what could pop this euphoria that we're seeing in the gold market. What keeps you up at night? What is the biggest risk right now? You flicked at the election at the top of, of the conversation. I don't know if it's geopolitical uncertainty, but there's a lot going on right now. What makes you nervous? Yeah, I think, Danielle, it's what you just touched on. I think there continues to be a lot of uncertainty around the marketplace. I think, you know, uh, I think, you know, the worst of COVID is behind us, but it's not totally behind us. We've seen a resurgence uh, certainly in uh, Toronto, cases are up for 400. Uh, uh, in Ontario, it's 700. We're beginning to see the Quebec government, in, 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 you know, bring in some additional restrictions. So, you know, uh, you know, I, I heard Dr. Fossey speak on Bloomberg uh, just uh, a week ago, and he was saying, "Look, a vaccine is 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 hopefully coming by the end of the year." Uh, but uh, you know, in terms of everybody being vaccinated, it won't happen until the end of next year. So, I think. You know, there's still a backdrop of a lot of uncertainty in the marketplace. And I think, you know, as everybody talked about, it's important that we remain very uh, diligent around uh, making sure that we manage our operating sites appropriately, uh, keep people safe and uh, and keep strong balance sheets to deal with the volatility that we're seeing in the marketplace. All right. I, I want to thank you all um, very much for your time today. I, I wish we had more time. Ben Lamb is the vice president and treasurer of Agnico Eagle Mines. Carol. Ben Ducci, Executive Vice President and CFO of I Am Gold, and Raman Randawa is the Senior VP and CFO of Capstone Mining. Thank you all very much for joining me today. I'm going to hand off now um, to my colleague, Paula Sambo, and our telecoms panel. Thank our audience as well for watching, and, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Hello, I'm here with Quebecor CFO, Hugh Simar. And we are here to talk some debt. Um, thank you for making the time uh, to talk to us, Hugh. And uh, since, since this is a fixed income event, I'll start right off with debt. I see that you have $0.2 billion in debt outstanding, and the weight average fixed coupon is 5.4%, and the average maturity is December 2024. Are you comfortable with that? Where do you see that going over the next couple of years? Yes, yes, that uh, absolutely. Um, a little over five billion, five point two billion net of the. Uh, the only comment I'd make is, um, as we hedge um, um, our U.S. debt, because part of our debt is in, is denominated in U.S. dollars, uh, which we hedge one hundred percent of. Uh, there is a um, there's an asset on our balance sheet for roughly a billion dollars. So that the the net debt is is exactly what you said, five point two billion. And um, yeah, a little over 5% uh, average coupon and uh, towards the end of 2024, early 2025 uh, average maturity. Um, you know, and, and we've, we've historically uh, managed our debt um, very conservatively uh, with a mix of uh, floating and fixed, a mix of US 
denominated Canadian denominated debt. Uh, it has been it has been um, coming down over time. We have been delevering uh, for for many years, and uh, we're actually quite proud of the the discipline that we've exercised over the past years. Ever since our uh, 2000, 2000 event of um, the purchase of Videotron and TVA, which we did in partnership, as you know, with the Caisse de dépôt and placement here in, in, uh, in Quebec. Um, and over and above uh, the uh, our various investments, most notably uh, in wireless, we launched wireless services in 2010 and invested more than two and a half billion dollars in a, in a network and in, in a spectrum, of course. Um, and we've also um, taken out our partner, the Caisse de Depot, uh, over uh, three transactions over since uh, starting in 2012, with the last one in 2018. And over and above all of this, we've managed to delever to about 2.7 times EBITDA. Um, so we're very, uh, very proud of that. And, um, you know, when we look at um, our, our uh, cash flow forecast and uh, uses of uh, of cash going forward, uh, we are indeed looking at some uh, some further delevering uh, over the next months and years. And, and do you have any goals there in terms of uh, net EBITDA to to that? Um, well, we um, the way we look at it, we're, we're comfortable with the with the um, the zone we're in. I'll call it that. You know, between two and a half and three times EBITDA. Um, is uh, we're we're comfortable. I think it is a very favorable uh, uh, leverage. It's actually uh, favorable to most, if not all, of our competitors and peers here in Canada. Uh, even though they are larger, they are a little bit more uh, more levered than we are. And it, it it also allows us, while at the same time allowing us some flexibility. So um, yeah, you know, we're we're very comfortable in that uh, to have reached and to be maintaining. And even uh, lowering that uh, that two and a half to three times range. Yes. Okay. And and while you are deleveraging, you told us around a year ago that you don't really have a credit rating upgrade among your goals while doing so. Is that still the case, or have you changed that? Well, flexibility is is important to us. Uh, but that being said, you know we are, um, as I've just said, you know we are delevering. And we are um, applying. Um, you know we have we have sizable and growing cash flows, and when we look at um, you know the the big uses of of that cash going forward, whether it's capex or it's spectrum uh, auctions, uh, dividends, stock buybacks. Um, you know, we see further potential for delevering. So even though it's not an objective in and of itself, I mean, at, at the end of the day, let me answer it this way. I mean, we're at the end of the day, what we want is to lower as much as possible uh, our cost of debt. So cool. So it's, it's as simple as that. And uh, delevering and uh, ultimately an investment grade rating, of course, allows us to do that. Um, but at the end of the day, if, if, uh, if there are other ways for us to, to tap the markets uh, at, reasonable, uh, at a reasonable cost of debt, then that certainly is something that, uh, that we'll be looking at as well. Okay. And as you talked about tapping the markets, uh, I'm thinking that you know, equity investors have been way more vocal about ESG demands in the past. And I wonder if your fixed income investors are starting to make the same kind of demands. And if they're not, are you considering going green anyway? Or uh, Yes, the, the investors, both equity and debt, have been increasingly bringing up uh, environmental concerns. And uh, But I'll be honest with you, we didn't wait for that. Uh, some time ago, we've launched a, uh, a very important plan here within Quebec, or we take our, our leadership in everything that's uh, that's environmentally friendly, very very seriously. Um, just uh, to throw a couple of uh, data points at you, 82% of all the energy we consume uh, here within the the, the Quebec or group comes from renewable sources, and half, about half of all of our emissions, our greenhouse gas emissions, come from the fleet, our fleet of vehicles. So uh, quite some time ago, we've put in a plan. Um, and have uh, started on it with a clear objective of uh, bringing our entire fleet of vehicles, which is over uh, 1,100 vehicles, you know, um, service trucks and, uh, 
and uh, uh, you know quality control and all of that. We've got we we have over a thousand uh, vehicles, and we have committed to bringing all of them uh, electric to electrify our entire fleet by 2030. Uh, we we have started and will continue. And it is very important for us to uh, to reach that goal, and we're well uh, underway. I mean, other things uh, I can speak to responsible procurement, of course, how we manage our, uh, our um, how we optimize our energy in all of our various uh, uh, buildings and, and premises, um, and also waste management. Over the past few years, we've uh, we've recycled nearly nine million um, like electronic devices, mostly uh, phones, of course. But other um, electric uh, and electronic devices, uh, which we've um, which we've refurbished and uh, reused, so we're very proud of that and are continuing uh, on that. And um, it is, um, you know, the whole uh, ESG field is is something that we take very seriously. We believe we have uh, we have a bit of a leadership role to play here uh, uh, as one of the uh, the major corporations in Quebec. And um, and are proud to be doing uh, our part and to be leading in that uh, in that field. And, and with all these adjustments you've made, do you cons do you think that perhaps the next bond you raise could be sustainable? Mm -hmm. Well, it's certainly uh, it's certainly something that we're uh, that we're looking at, and um, it is uh, it is uh, a very uh, a very clear objective of ours. And uh, not knowing really when the next uh, next issue will be, it's a little bit uh, difficult for me to commit to it. But it is certainly is something that we're that uh, we have in our uh, as an objective in the near future for sure. Okay, got it. Um, here's a question we just got from the audience: um, What are your plans with regards to building the 5G infrastructure in Canada? 5G. We have uh, we have started um, quite a few initiatives on the on the 5G front. Uh, we are working. Uh, we announced that uh, last year. So as you know, we are working with Samsung, uh, who's our uh, who's our partner on that front, and uh, we have been working very very closely with them ever since uh, we've made that um, uh, that deal with them. Um, we have started to invest um, in, in infrastructure and will continue. We will, in, of course, uh, we need more spectrum and the 35, the auction for the, uh, the public auction for the 3500 spectrum, uh, which was delayed. It was supposed to happen this year, but for obvious reasons, it was, it was delayed until next year and should happen in, uh, uh, in June, we believe. Uh, so we will be bidding for that in our regions, and that will give us um, that will give us the necessary uh, spectrum, along with the 600, which we uh, which we uh, purchased um, at the uh, at the last auction uh, last year. Will give us um, you know the necessary spectrum for 5G, and we will be continuing over the next few years uh, in a very staggered and very disciplined uh, approach uh, to invest the necessary. Uh, the necessary capital to make sure that we are as the as the revenue models and the uh, uh, the business cases the uh, both B to C and B to B with respect to five G come to uh, uh, a little bit more formalized that uh, we are ready to go and uh, we are ready to uh, to be in the uh, uh, you know offering five uh, G services and five uh, G equipment for sure. And uh, how how would you finance the five G? expansion would that be through cash flow or mix of cash flow and new debt um it's uh, you know the, the the way we see our 5g investments uh they are in continuation you know don't forget that uh, networks and uh um our investments in networks and spectrum is a, is is an ongoing is is an ongoing need you know that you know there was the 4g the 3g the 4g the now we're into lte advanced you know call it the Four and a half or four and three quarters G. So you know we continue to invest and to fund uh, all of these investments through. Partly we've we've done some debt in the past. Right now we have availabilities uh, for sure to cover uh, the investments that we'll make for 5G, which, as I said, will be staggered over the next uh, the next few years. So we don't foresee any specific spike that would be. Uh, that would be of concern, as we, you know, we have more than, uh, you know, 1.8 billion uh, of availabilities uh, at this point. So that more than, that's that more than covers, you know, our spectrum uh, 
and investment uh, requirements for, for quite some time. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I'm interested in getting your thoughts on the Rogers Kojak deal or non deal at this point. And also, <laughs> would you consider making an offer for Kojak? Why or why not? Um, let me answer you in this way. I mean, Cogeco is, is obviously a company we know very well, even though we don't compete with them. Uh, we share the Quebec, uh, the, the Quebec footprint with them. Uh, you know, both Videotron and, and Cogeco are historical uh, cable companies uh, that have grown side by side and um, are controlled by two families who know, who know each other quite well. Um, so there are people that we, 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 we work with from time to time um, and uh, know them well. It's, um, you know, my comment would be, I, I think the most interesting thing you said is the non-deal. You know, I, I think we, we certainly understand and I think the family, the Ode family has made very clear, has made it very clear a number of times, I think, over the past few days. Uh, that they are not uh, willing, to, willing to entertain this deal. And I think we have to respect um, that position. You know, they're focusing on managing and developing uh, their company, investing in the future, uh, in new services and platforms. And um, I think, um, you know, we, we know them well enough to respect, I think, that wish. And, um, and I think, um, you know, uh, whether at some point we, we end up working together, um, is, is something that we'd be happy, but it, you know, it's not something I, I'd comment on at this point. Okay, I respect that. And what other areas would it, are you looking at for M&A? What, what would make sense for you? Um, if, a few things. Uh, first of all, a little bit in the continuation of what we've done over the past few years. You know, we've uh, uh, we've made a number of tuck-in acquisitions, most notably on the uh, on the content side. Um, you know, our ecosystem here in, in French Canada or in Quebec is, uh, works very well and we, it is important for us to continue to invest in the production of local, differentiated and unique content. And so we've made, as I'm sure you know, over the past few years, some acquisitions, content pr uh, production capabilities, and uh, we'll continue to do so. Uh, because, as I said, that really feeds uh, very well our our ecosystem between our our media properties and our telecom properties, and and allows us to offer uh, differentiated and as I say, unique content in in French uh, to our to our audience here in Quebec. So we'll you know we continue to, we continue to be on the lookout for um, for interesting opportunities on that front. Um, same with with uh, you know with cable um, cable companies, smaller cable companies might be of an, you know uh, might be of interest to us. We continue, as I said, to be uh, uh, to be on the lookout for that. Uh, globally speaking, on the M and A front, for the past few years, we've been more opportunistic, and we intend to continue to do so as an opportunity comes up. Um, you know, we're we're interested in looking at it. Uh, other than that, I, I think I, I should, you know, the, I think the point is that we are really focusing on, on operations and, and delivering. I mean, we, we, we still have, uh, we still have uh, quite a bit of runway here in Quebec in developing our wireless services and optimizing our wireline services um, and have been hard at work on that um, and uh, continuing to invest. Um, you know, an M&A will, will, you know, comes along, as I said, um, and if the right opportunity comes along, at the, then we, you know, we jump. Um, otherwise, we'll continue to focus on, on delivering uh, the best services and the best service to, uh, to our customer, to our, to our clients and our customers. And, and would it make sense for you to grow outside of Quebec too? Um, well, we still, I, the first thing I should point out, as I just said, is we still have quite a bit of runway in Quebec. I mean, our market, for, for example, in the, in the wireless, uh, things have been going very, very well. Uh, as I said earlier, we launched our first, uh, our first wireless services in 2010. It's only been 10 years and we grew to, uh, you know, uh, close to 20% market share. Uh, we launched a second brand, Fizz, um, in 2018. And um, so this has been this has been a great success for us, but we still feel that we have we have quite a bit of uh, of work to do, and um, and we still have uh, quite a few uh, clients that we still don't uh, don't have. 
So uh, we're focusing really on developing that, developing the business and even on the wireline side and on the broadband side, um, you know, delivering our new, our new platforms, whether it's our IPTV platform, Helix, uh, and others uh, on, uh, you know, to compete uh, more, more effectively every year with, um, um, you know, on, on both sides of the equation, both the, the, the wireless and the wireline. Um, you know, if um, in the right circumstances, that being said, you know, um, as I said, we launched Fizz. Fizz gives us uh, an interesting platform um, and the right, uh, you know, the right expertise, the right platform. And uh, uh, it, puts us, it puts us in a position where we could look at uh, uh, an expansion outside of Quebec. Now, whether the right conditions and the right uh, circumstances um, come together is uh, is something to be uh, to be seen. Uh, but um, so my answer would be that we're, we're we're still focusing on our home market where we still have uh, we still have some market share to gain. Um, should there be the right uh, the right conditions and the right uh, the right circumstances for us to, in partnership with with others. Uh, or on our own to uh, to launch our uh, our services effectively outside of Quebec. That may be that may be something we'll we'll look at. I mean, we we decided quite some time ago not to build our own network uh, outside of Quebec for obvious uh, economic reasons. It just wouldn't uh, make sense for us. But that being said, you know, whether through uh, as I said partnerships or or other um, uh, or other arrangements. Um, if the right circumstances come about, we'll certainly, again, you know, we, we tend to be opportunistic. So if the right opportunity comes around, uh, we'll certainly look at it. That makes sense. Um, could you talk a bit about trends in cable television? I mean, it's no secret that a lot of cable companies have been losing subscribers, which I imagine could be a challenge for Videotron. So I wanted to understand if you see that as a challenge and what the plan is there. You're, you're referring to cable, right? To a TV distribution, right? Yeah, to cord cutting. Of course, uh, you know, cord cutting is a is a global uh, uh, is a global phenomenon. Um, we, we are a little bit uh, more protected because of the language in Quebec. But that being said, we um, you know we have a number of plans in place. Um, one of which is Helix, which I spoke about, which is a a, a very high performance. Uh, IPTV platform, which we launched last year, uh, about a year ago at this time, um, you know, which um, is a defensive move. Obviously, we don't, uh, you know, it is a market that is declining, but we believe that uh, through very uh, unique and very superior uh, functionalities, uh, we are able to, you know, that core group of people, not not the core nevers, you know, who wouldn't, you know, who didn't even think of uh, of, uh, of subscribing to, uh, you know, to TV distribution, and um, and neither the the, the, the more stable um, uh, group of customers which we have, which we've gained over the years through bundling and all that, which tend to be the, the you know the families and the multi users. Uh, which tend to be uh, tend, tend to have lower churn for us, but to address this sort of central, you know, cord cutting, people who are starting to think that perhaps um, you know they don't need a, a cable subscription and maybe OTT is is enough for them. We believe that uh, Helix is the right product, and actually it's been performing extremely well, with uh, you know more than three hundred thousand, almost four hundred thousand uh, subscribers in, in in less than a year. Um, to address, you know, that that um, that um, uh, that need uh, for content in a very simple, in a very unified way, that at the end of the day makes them uh, ma makes them uh, conclude that you know what, I'll I'll stick to this a little bit longer because I can find really what I want, what I'm looking for, really uh, really good, and I, I have access to. I mean, whether it's a it's on it's on an OTT platform, whether it's on the the regular waves, whether and wherever um, you know Helix is is really a fabulous platform for for people to um, to to find and consume uh, uh, content. So uh, and there are others on the on the broadband uh, side, uh, other initiatives that we've put in place. You know we have a, a very high uh, performing network, as you know. Uh, and uh, we've been, um, you know, our our, uh, our our customer satisfaction is extremely high. So we we've got a number of initiatives in place. 
to uh, to combat that uh, that general um, you know uh, and global trend uh, that is cord cutting. Okay. And before I let you go, I wanted to ask a question about one of my favorite Quebec companies. Uh, Quebec Corps was interested in bidding for Cirque du Soleil, and I wanted to hear your views on how the process unfolded there, and how would the acquisition, had it worked, fit in with your strategy? Well, as we said at the time uh, that we uh, that we um, showed an, an interest in the Cirque du Soleil, you know, our position was simple. It was to say this is a this is this is a great company. This is one of the most uh, iconic brands from Quebec around the world, which produces very valuable uh, original content, uh, event content, and uh, we, you know, we said it is a it is a shame that uh, for two reasons. Of course, there was a global crisis, which is still ongoing, and secondly, because of a broken capital structure, it is a company that it, that finds itself uh, in a in a very difficult situation. Now, since then. Uh, a number of things have happened. I mean, first of all, the crisis has not uh, um, has not subsided, you know, and has continued. And certainly, there is continuing uh, um, uncertainty as to when uh, these types of events will be able to to be held again. And secondly, well, the you know the bondholders, the uh, the debt holders of the company. Uh, took control um, and um, are in the midst of finalizing a deal to uh, to assume uh, you know control of the company, and um, that was uh, you know that was uh, that's, that, that was the logical out outcome to be to be expected in in, in such a situation and as such a highly leveraged company, and uh, we'll have to see where that uh, leads them and um, and see uh, you know where the prospects for uh, the recovery. Uh, how they come out, because, um, you know, we're certainly not out of the woods uh, yet. Uh, as you know, um, you know, a number of areas in the U.S. and certainly in Canada are still are still struggling uh, with the uh, the coronavirus. Um, so I think the Cirque du Soleil is a, again, is a very valuable, a very, very creative company and a, a huge brand, but that is uh, that is facing some, some some very difficult times. Okay. Uh, Hugh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it was a pleasure having you here. It was a pleasure to be speaking with you. Thank you. And now I'll pass on the baton to my colleague in Ottawa, Chris Fournier. Hello and welcome to the uh, Bloomberg Canadian Fixed Income Conference. Today I'm very pleased to welcome um, Tamara Lawson from Quadriel, she's the chief financial officer there. Also, Cecilia Williams at Allied REIT, also chief financial officer, and Peter Sweeney at Smart Centers, um, chief financial officer. We have three chief financial officers with us today. And um, I, I'd like to start by asking you all, uh, and maybe Cecilia, you can you can take this question to begin with. Um, so there there is no end end date for COVID. Um, Real estate investment trusts have been beaten up quite badly um, since the start of lockdowns. Uh, we see that the um, the overall S and P uh, uh, Toronto Composite Index is down something like uh, four percent this year, where uh, the real estate sub index, which comprises mostly uh, REITs, is down more like twenty percent. So obviously, there's some negative sentiment around REITs. Um, how are you feeling at the moment about, can you just walk me through how you're thinking about uh, risk, the risks and the uncertainties for your business at the moment? Absolutely. Thank you for, for having me on this panel. It certainly is very different from the situation that my peers on this panel, uh, what we were experiencing a year ago when we were in New York actually doing this live, which seems like a dream now, thinking back. <laughs> Yeah, I, I feel like Allied has always been preparing almost for a situation like this where there's a lot of uncertainty and now we can almost see things in action. And for those of us that didn't live through the real estate meltdown in the early 90s, it's really certain things coming to life. And this is me trying to see the, the positive in this situation. And, you know, you can read about crisis management all you want, but actually having to go through it 
as a leader, as, as a manager is, is quite different. So from a finance, there are different aspects to this, of course. So financially allied, we've always been very conservative. And so we've always thought very hard about our debt metrics and how do we make sure that we're never caught in a situation where we're unable to execute on our strategy. So keeping do low debt metrics means that we can do that even today. And so we have a lot of liquidity. We're in a position where we won't need to go to either the debt or the equity capital markets. We can fund everything through 2021 um, with a lot of certainty in terms of how we will meet our commitments, certainly for development and in terms of our, our current portfolio. Operationally, the focus has really been with our tenants about how do we make sure that people feel safe in our buildings as they slowly start to come back to the office. Vancouver started to repopulate in May, middle of May is when we started having our office tenants come back. So we're roughly at about 60% repopulation there, 95% on the retail side. Calgary reopened in June, and there we're at about 30% office repopulation, 30% um, on the retail side. And then Montreal and Toronto were both reopened in early July, and there we're at about our office space is about 20% repopulation and 95% on the retail side. So I feel like things have been going in the right direction with more visibility now than there was at the beginning. But that's assuming that things continue with the reopening based on the numbers that, that we've seen today, which I, I believe are the highest since the reopening um, that, that might shift. Uh, Tamara, what would you, uh, how would you uh, respond? What are you, how are you thinking about the risks and the uncertainties at the moment in your business? Well, um, thanks uh, also for having me today. And, and I agree, this is a very, very different environment than we were in um, a year ago. But, um, it, you know, we're doing this. So I think this, it shows that um, people are very adaptable. Um, companies are adaptable and, and we're, you know, we've been adapting to this new environment. Similar to Cecile, um, you know, I think we've been preparing for, we were preparing for a recession. We weren't preparing, uh, we did not foresee obviously a pandemic, but um, we did feel that we were late, late in the economic cycle and we'd already begun uh, planning for a recession and we'd added liquidity sources and we're keeping leverage um, low. Um, you know, we, below our long-term target um, in response. Um, our, uh, on the investment strategy side, um, you know, our investment strategy and our, and our active management have been critical factors in minimizing the impact of COVID. Our limited exposure and, and underweighting in, in more impacted asset classes have really helped, helped us to, to minimize the impact. And, and as Cecile mentioned, on the operational side of things, um, you know, that's been a big focus. Um, we've been really providing a lot of support to our employees and our, our tenants, especially our frontline workers who, who are located at our properties. Um, this, this has been a priority. Um, you know, we've been very focused on providing support to our tenants. Um, we've supported them um, in the secret program, for example, and uh, developed a tenant um, uh, tool to help them um, with that with that program, um, and you know we've been we've been really communicating to our employees uh, on a you know more frequent basis, and and really increased activities around employment engagement, just to ensure that everyone can you know is, is working effectively, and has the tools that they really need to work remotely. Um, we've been in constant contact with with BCI and our third party clients um, to make sure that, you know, they're completely up to speed um, about what's going on and what actions we're taking. Um, and then to offset the impact on revenues that we've seen, um, you know, we've tightened our expense control and, and also deferred non-essential capital expend expenditures where possible. Um, and on the liability management side, we've increased liquidity sources, 
um, as rates have declined and, and credit spreads normalized and we've raised additional capital. Um, and we, uh, we've also fast-tracked workplace efficiencies and accelerated technology investments in response to the, to the impact of COVID. And finally, I would say we've, we've invested in some new initiatives that really um, capture you know, future opportunity and value. Um, Peter, if I get your opinion, I mean, your, your business, uh, because of its uh, weighting more heavily towards retail, uh, in some ways has, you know, has had uh, the most challenging, perhaps, environment. How do, you, how do you think about the risks and the uncertainties uh, to your business going forward? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, we scratch our heads, frankly, a little bit here um, at Smart Centers. Our units are currently trading at a level that is yielding uh, a distribution rate of uh, almost 9%. And for a company of our size, given the alternative uh, initiatives that we have moving forward, mixed use initiatives and the expectations for those initiatives, we struggle to understand why the market uh, currently is discounting us uh, at the level and to the levels that they are. Um, I think it's fair to say there is a level of uh, negative sentiment in the marketplace for anything that has a retail connotation associated with it. Um, and so, you know, because we're painted with the same broad brush and because our platform, historically at least, has been predicated on having open format Walmart anchored shopping centers that are predominantly retail in focus, uh, we do get painted with that same brush. But you know, I think it's generally known that an open format shopping center in this environment uh, has a much larger stable of tenants that are open, of uh, shoppers and patrons who are visiting those open format shopping centers, certainly on a relative basis to an indoor or an enclosed shopping center. Um, so, you know, we struggle, frankly. We struggle to understand the market. As we all know, the markets are fickle. Um, and at, at least for now, sentiment seems to be on the side of uh, multi-res type um, investment. We're hoping that over the course of time, as we um, unveil our mixed-use development strategy, which includes um, uh, a lot of multi-res development, some condo development, um, senior citizens housing, as well as self-storage um, facilities, that you know the market will be receptive uh, because for us having a Walmart anchored shopping center portfolio provides us with a safe, secure, and very frankly stable basis upon which to catapult and lever our growth for the future. Um, I think it's safe to say that we're blessed with that, but it didn't happen by accident. Um, the, the reality is the portfolio was built for heavy weather. It was built for sort of stormy weather when there may be some challenges. And notwithstanding, you know, what we're going through today uh, as, an, as a society, uh, our retail portfolio continues to outperform. And we continue to enjoy relatively high um, uh, rates of occupancy. And, not, and that doesn't suggest for a moment that tenants aren't feeling it and that there's some retail tenants that may not be able to survive for lots of different reasons. But the reality is, you know, our shopping centers continue to be um, high traffic, uh, visited by high traffic areas and visited by consumers uh, across Canada. So we're hoping that, again, in the fullness of time, given that uh, we're starting now just this quarter, in fact, Q3 of 2020, to start enjoying the benefits of some of the condominium closings um, that we've been speaking about now for almost three years, that that will at least give investors further confidence in smart centers uh, as an entity that has uh, catapulted itself from what was previously an entity focused almost exclusively on uh, retail uh, type investments to one that is now becoming uh, multi-directional and multifaceted. So it's a long-winded answer, I think, Chris, but at least it perhaps gives you a perspective on how we at smart centers think of what we're enduring currently and perhaps the way we see the markets and hoping that, you know, confidence in smart centers at least will return sooner, much rather than later. Uh, Tamara, if I could ask you, uh, maybe um, you're not a publicly traded company, so you don't uh, disclose um, 
metrics in the same way as uh, as Peter and Cecilia, but uh, one key metric for your business is uh, collect collection rates. And I wonder if I could just get your get your uh, take on the latest, you know, your latest view on on collection rates for your portfolios. Sure. Um, so in you know in, in each sector, it's a little bit different. Um, but I'll just talk a little bit about the, the major uh, sectors. Um, the one the one sector that has been um, very impact has been um, hospitality. We um, have very little hospitality in our portfolio. Um, you know, less than you know less than uh, a fraction of one percent. So um, I won't really talk about hospitality. Um, but the the other two sectors. Um, that have been more impacted, as you know, Peter mentioned, obviously uh, retail in certain segments of retail more than others, um, and then also obviously office, just given um, working, you know, the working from home scenario. Um, we, you know, we have a very um, strong portfolio that we think, um, you know, performs well in um, in all cycles. So our our rent collections actually. Have been, you know, quite strong across the sectors. So, um, in uh, multifamily, uh, we our collections have been um, in the high 90s. Um, in the office sector, in the mid 90s. Um, industrial has also been in the mid 90s, um, and then retail um, has been around 70 percent. So, um, you can you can see that. Um, you know, other than retail, all the other sectors are performing well. In our, we have a very strong office portfolio, for example, um, in primarily located in uh, Toronto and Vancouver, um, with some um, also exposure in Edmonton, Calgary, as well. Um, and the but our tenants are you know very very strong tenants. Um, you know, law firms, um, national accounting firms. Um, you know, other other very strong tenants. Um, so the collections on that front have, you know, have been uh, quite high. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we also have been supporting our tenants with the CEQA program, um, which really provides the tenant, the government put, puts in 50%, um, we kick in 25% as the landlord and the tenant pays 25%. Um, and those, that program is really only available to smaller businesses, so it's not available to all of our tenants. But um, you know, the ones that it is available to, we've been supporting them on that front. Um, you know, which has also helped um, on the collection front with smaller tenants. Um, Cecilia, if we uh, look at your company according to your your uh, second quarter financial statement, you've had uh, collection rates of about ninety five percent. Um, is that something you're looking uh, forward? You're thinking that's going to improve, or uh, can you give us your view on uh, uh, on collection rates, please? We're not seeing much of a difference in Q3 from Q2. Um, obviously, the final numbers are still to come, but from our conversations with tenants and what we saw for the months of July and August, one of the things that we did in Q2 that we don't plan to have continue beyond September 30th is we did provide some of our tenants a deferral option, particularly the ones that had not been established long enough before the shutdown to really um, have, have a, I guess, a customer base solidly lined up. And so we did offer deferrals. So you're right, in Q2, we collected 95%, we deferred 3%, and then the abatement, um, like what Tamara was referring to, we did participate in the secret program. And so 1.8% of, of our rent in Q2 was abated. The program, as everybody knows, was also extended for the three quarters in Q3, with September explicitly being the last month of the program. And so we expect a very similar breakdown between uh, abated rent, so almost 2% in Q3, with more collected and much less deferred in Q3, so closer to a 98% uh, 
uh, collection. I expect we'll have some deferrals still. It just won't be the 3% that we had in Q2. I also believe that the government will implement another program. I just, the details have been very sparse and I don't know if it will involve some form of abatement on, on behalf of owners. It hasn't been clear yet, but our working assumption a is that- Sorry, a, a program similar to SECRA or something different? I don't know. I just, the government has said that they were looking to implement something else. And so our, our working premise right now is that whatever that new program is, and hopefully that there will be details soon, but that we're assuming it will not involve any further abatements by the landowners or by the property owners. I don't know if that's a reasonable assumption or not, but that's what our working assumption is today. Okay. Uh, Peter, for the uh, your, your most recent financial statement, you anticipated 94% to 96% collections rate, and I believe that's excluding deferrals and uh, tenants who are in the SECRA program. Is that about right? What's your what's your view? What What's uh, the latest you can tell us on your anticipated collection rates? I think that's approximately correct. I mean, we as, as a predominant retail um, retail landlord, the Q2 period for us, um, you know, resulted in the April collection levels being perhaps lower than than you would prefer them to be. We we ended April at approximately 70% being collected. Now, keep in mind, uh, our shopping centers are open format shopping centers, so. We don't have, with the exception of two or three, uh, we don't have any enclosed shopping centers, which really should be viewed differently. But, um, you know, if April was the worst month for us where we had 70% uh, or so collected, uh, we continued to see demonstrative improvement over the last six months such that, and um, I think we communicated this uh, a few months ago, we would expect certainly by the end of Q3 when we're announcing our results, to be able to say that our collection levels are in that 94 to 96% range. Um, and then when you add deferrals into that mix as well and account for those, I think it would be perhaps even higher. So, you know, we're continuing to see businesses return to whatever that new level of normalcy might be, at least in the interim, uh, until there's a vaccine that uh, hopefully arrives soon. Uh, and those tenants are continuing to sort of find ways to grow their businesses, to attract customers into their stores and and uh, operations, and as well pay their rents. Um, it goes also without saying that the SECRA program for small to mid mid-sized businesses in Canada, I think, was a godsend. Uh, many of our tenants, and I'm sure uh, my two counterparts on the panel as well, Many of our tenants sort of uh, were were beneficiaries of that program, and it's worked very, very well over the last six months. But Cecilia's right; it's now appropriate to think that that six-month time frame has lapsed, and perhaps there will be an alternative program soon introduced and announced by the federal government. Um, but it's time for Canadian businesses, hopefully, to find ways of returning returning to some level of normalcy. Um, and again, we're hoping that this vaccine that's uh, been spoken about and talked about so much is able to be introduced into the general marketplace uh, over the next three to four months. And if I could just, um, you know, we have seen COVID numbers ticking back up um, recently. Um, what are your feelings about a second wave and how do you protect for that? How do you think about that in terms of risk perspective? Where, where are we uh, in terms of second wave? You know, it's a good question. Um, certainly, again, given the nature of our of our assets, our retail assets, at least as as uh, open format shopping centers, I think there's a, a certain level of um, of comfort that shoppers in those environments feel. Um, we do have two office buildings as well that um, uh, probably not unlike Cecilio's experience and Tamara's experience, we've uh, modified again to assure those visiting or, or occupying those buildings to allow them to feel safe and give them peace of mind. Um, and it would be our expectation, given you know the government's mandate, that all of us have a requirement to wear masks in open environments and in public environments, that that finds its way to uh, reduce the spread of this virus. I think 
also from the um, from the reports I've read uh, most recently, some of this uh, some of the challenges that we're now experiencing vis-a-vis -a, -vis a second wave are concentrated in particular areas, and there's perhaps some some real social reasons for those um, those increases in um, in the virus seemingly uh, spreading. But um, I think generally those increases don't appear to be coming from shopping centers. They certainly don't appear to be coming from office buildings, et cetera. So um, again, all of us are doing all we can and more to ensure that people who uh, work, uh, visit, uh, and patronize our assets are, uh, are comfortable and have a certain level of confidence that they can shop or work there without uh, being infected with this disease. Tamara, Tamara what would you say to that? Um, yeah, no, I, I would I would agree with um, what Peter has has said. Um, I, I do think that we're probably in the middle of a you know second wave now, as we've you know seen uh, an increase in cases. Um, but I don't I don't think the shock to the system will be you know as significant um, as you know the first wave. Uh, both you know for us as a comp company, but I would say the community in general. Um, you know, I think like most companies, we have a playbook and protocols, um, you know, for shutting down and, and reopening facilities. Um, you know, our workforce has adapted uh, to working from home and, you know, have proven that they can work very effectively and efficiently remotely. Um, I think the healthcare system is better prepared and uh, more equipped to deal uh, with an increase in cases and with, you know, better treatment and, and more equipment to deal with serious cases. Um, I think the knowledge, both in the medical community and the public at large, is is much greater. Um, you know, we've we've seen the effectiveness of certain strategies, and and we know that, as Peter mentioned, wearing you know masks and social distancing is effective in controlling cases. And you know, I think our seniors and those most at risk are being better protected. Um, and you know, increases in cases, as Peter mentioned, are in certain um, areas and and I would say in the more resilient age category as well. Um, you know, so I think all those things, um, you know, and the fact I think that, you know, there's a number of vaccines that are being currently tested around the world. I think there's reasons, um, you know, to be hopeful that a, you know, vaccine will be available in, in the, you know, not too distant future. So numbers are ticking up, uh, but Canadians in general are better able to cope with it. And uh, so almost like even if, if uh, we do head into or are in the middle of a second wave, that the impact perhaps economically shouldn't be as severe. Uh, Cecilia, would you agree with that? I would agree with that. I heard one of the health ministers, and I don't remember her name, comment that she felt that if there was, if and when there was a second wave, that the approach to a shutdown should perhaps be a little more, I, I believe she used the word surgical or more targeted, which I completely yep. agree with. Let's really isolate and protect the most vulnerable. Uh, it's funny, I actually, I thought that the second wave would be precipitated by the return to school, but it, it hasn't been that case at all. It, it's interesting, actually, I was, be prepared for that second wave to be once my kids went to school. Um, thankfully, it hasn't come from there, but it has come from, I think, uh, other people maybe not taking it as seriously as they should be. So I think taking a more targeted approach and to what Peter and Tamara said, more of a culture of acceptance around just wear your mask, <laughs> always, <laughs> unless you're sitting by yourself. Uh, and, and not within a, a two meter radius of someone else, or even if you are, just keep your mask on if you're out in public. I think that culture has helped. Um, I heard one of the gentlemen from Brookfield comment that they were able to fully reopen their office in South Korea, and I believe Shanghai, they were above 95% repopulation because there there's just always been a culture of mask acceptance. And so people are very accustomed to it. And I think that'll be maybe one of the remnants of this COVID situation where, you know, 9-11, the remnants was extra security at the base of various buildings, particularly in New York. I think the remnants from this will be 
there'll be it'll be more common to see people walking around with a mask. Um, and I hope we can avoid a second complete shutdown, but that targeted approach to me makes sense and should allow us to keep a lot of things that are currently open. Uh, really appreciate your time today. I, I know there's a lot we didn't discuss. There's a, there's a lot there for a future conversation. So again, I thank you uh, for joining us today. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Derek DeCluet. I'm the Canada Managing Editor for Bloomberg News. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Marc-Andre Blanchard to, uh, to our Fixed Income Conference. He uh, was Canada's ambassador to the United Nations for the past four years until recently, uh, and has uh, now joined the Caisse de Depot as executive vice president and head of CDPQ Global, uh, the international operations of La Caisse. Uh, welcome to you, sir. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank uh, National Bank Financial also for sponsoring it. So thank you very much for the invitation. Yes, thank you to National Bank of Canada, and uh, let's jump right in. Um, not only is this a new job for you, but it's also a new role for La Caisse. Uh, so why don't you uh, tell the audience a bit about uh, what you do and where your, uh, where your energies are focused? Well, you know, like everybody knows about La Caisse to a large extent. You know that it's the second largest institutional investor in Canada, that we have close to 303, 330 billion dollars under uh, asset management. We, uh, we are strongly diversified, but what maybe people don't know as well is that uh, today we're about a third of our investments are in Canada, a third in the US and a third in the rest of the world. And um, we have 10 offices uh, throughout the world uh, that, uh, that allow us to actually, uh, uh, you know, build partnerships and capture uh, local information and business opportunities and and help, you know, the goal is to help La Caisse uh, continue to enhance its global approach and uh, and actually leverage better our, our our knowledge that is across the uh, across the globe. So you know, you you also know that, uh, for example, we we you know we're the top 15 largest uh, global investors in the world, but we're the third in in uh, in infrastructure. And uh, in infrastructure, you know, we own all sorts of things like airports, transports, uh, public transit, renewable energy, natural gas, pipeline, ports, and uh, around the world. And so, and 90% of our assets at La Caisse are managed internally. So you can imagine that creates all sorts of needs and uh, for information, for coordination, uh, for uh, uh, working better together, uh, all of the asset classes, uh, to actually develop opportunities and manage an investments and uh, uh, a greater presence. It's all about assessing the, assessing the risk properly. So this is, this is one part of the job. The other part of the job is partnership, making sure that we are the first call on uh, by the best partners throughout the world. And, and that is also making sure that we leverage the, the, the value of La Caisse and what we bring to actually uh, make sure that we maximize uh, these partnerships. And, and I would say since, um, you know, I began working uh, just three weeks ago and I'm new to the investment field. So, uh, but, you know, one thing that has come out a lot is, you know, in all corners of the world, governments are now more important than they were before the pandemic. So that actually has enhanced or increased uh, the demand for all sorts of things in relation to not only government relations, but also intelligence. And uh, we know that we will need social licenses for some of our infrastructure. We know that we will need to uh, foresee some uh, regulatory changes that will actually change the nature of the risk that we are undertaking or the, the, even the value of some of our investment. So all of these things are becoming more important. And, and there was the felt, uh, the, the leadership of Charles Lemon, our new CEO, that thought we needed better coordination on, on all of these issues. So that's what I'm, I'm, I'm doing. That's my role. So with, with only one third of the assets, uh, and this is, this is obviously a, you know, a huge pool of capital you're dealing with, well over $300 billion, um, only one third of the assets outside of the U.S. and Canada. Do you foresee that that percentage might rise? And if, and if so, how might the case uh, approach that problem of, 
of international diversification and, and the risks that come with it? Well, the, we, we would like to have a little bit more investments in some developed countries uh, uh, in, in, in Western Europe, for example. Uh, we are uh, focusing on uh, on on some uh, French and German investments and also some Scandinavian uh, opportunities and uh, we have a strong foothold in the UK already. Uh, in in Southeast Asia, we're looking at uh, expanding our our reach in in, in Japan and Korea, um, uh, to name only these two countries. And then you have the emerging markets where we've been present in the last four or five years, India. Brazil, Mexico, and a few others where we in Colombia, where we've really uh, built, some, bought some, and got involved in. In some cases, it's in infrastructure. In some cases, it's in uh, private uh, equity stuff. And uh, we we will continue. But obviously, um, you know the the what you that's where you you need really good market intel, good uh, an ability to assess the risk properly, and uh, to actually be connected locally to make sure that actually uh, you understand what you're doing and that uh, you not only develop opportunities, minimize risk, and obviously uh, we're in the business of, uh, of uh, making sure we get good returns. So are, are you in a position to uh, uh, sort of increase the, the talent that you've got internally in some of those uh, international offices, or are you looking for more outside partnerships in those places? Uh, you know, how, we, how will you handle that? Uh, that it's going to be all of the above. Gathering? Yeah. It's all of the above. I mean, you need good partners. The good partners, good local partners will bring you good intel and good, uh, actually good ability to connect with the authorities or with the stakeholders of some investments. But you also need uh, good advisors, and so uh, so we have developed a group of advisors that will continue to develop around the world that actually are not necessarily uh, full-time employees of Lacaze, but come in and out for some specific and some some specialized advice or some regional uh, advice. And then we have the head of offices. So we will have we have three hubs: one in New York City for the United States and Latin America; the other in in uh, in London for uh, the, the UK and Europe, and then we have uh, one in Singapore for Asia, the Asia Pacific region. So what? Uh, so these hubs uh, are. Um, uh, we have a, a, a few dozen people in each of these hubs uh, that actually uh, some of them are from the asset classes and direct link between it, the, with the asset classes in Canada, and some of them, like the head of office, is usually someone that actually brings can make connection open doors, uh, get market intel, and, and actually uh, develop some opportunities and obviously help with some, some of the risks involved. Right. Um, I'd like to ask you about climate change because, because the case, uh, um, you know, going back even to, to, uh, to Mr. Sabia as the previous CEO discussed climate a lot as a big investment theme. Um, I, I know that you're, you're relatively new in the job, but can you tell us how you think about um, the problem of climate change, how it affects investment decisions, and how it might affect, you know, what what the case will do. So let me talk to you once, uh, just a, a little bit uh, about from my perspective at the UN on this. Uh, I can tell you now we believe that you know governments around the world in developed economies have poured a lot of money in the COVID nineteen um, uh, uh, situation, but. Um, I think that will only accentuate the problem we had before that, which is that you know um, governments, whether you're from a developed country and even less from a developing country, have no resources to, to actually build the infrastructure needed to actually fight climate change. And this is an I when I was ambassador of Canada to you and I was always going to the private sector and say, this don't wait for the government to do anything on this. The government can do a few things like regulate and make some minor investment here and there and some tweaks, but it's up to the private sector. Without the allocation, a better allocation of capital, just the better alignment of capital with sustainable development, we're going to fail, fail in this issue of, uh, of fighting climate change. And at Lacaze, and one of the things that attracted me at Lacaze was that Lacaze was, all, was such a great uh, actually world leader in this issue of, of uh, the fight of climate change and the leadership amongst institutional investors. So 
we have a, a, an approach to play a constructive role in, in the transition uh, to a low carbon economy. We focus on managing climate uh, related risk efficiently and, and um, actually we also see a lot of opportunities resulting from the transition. So you alleged, uh, you mentioned Michael Sabia three years ago, uh, we, uh, under the leadership of Michael Sabia, there was uh, um, some quantitative targets in terms of greenhouse gas emissions were, uh, and reductions were actually set. And uh, we had some targets for low carbon investments. So, you know, they were, at first they appeared very ambitious, those targets, and, um, and it, still it's a challenge in some ways, but, um, you know, we, we all made it happen. Uh, it took a lot of collaboration um, across, across uh, our, our teams. Uh, it took also the compensation to be aligned with those objectives. That's an important point. And so, we, you know, we have two targets. We have the first one is increasing our low carbon investment uh, by 80% between 2017 and 2020, 2020. And at this point, we have managed to actually increase, exceed this number. So we did more than 80%. And we doubled the value of low carbon assets to reach 34 billion at the end of 2019. And so we're looking at this number to continue to grow, but this is a success story. The second one, was a target about reducing our carbon, uh, carbon intensity per, do per dollar invested by 25% uh, by 2025. So to achieve this goal, we attribute you know, carbon budgets to each of our portfolios in all of our asset classes. And uh, this government tools allow, uh, governance tools allow us to set annual uh, carbon intensity limits per portfolio. And so they are, and teams, they include that in the, the, these carbon budgets in their annual strategic planning and uh, assess the carbon footprint of each investment decision that they do. So we need to reduce, as a whole, our holdings in high carbon uh, intensity assets. We need to acquire uh, low carbon assets. And also the third part, which is a big part for like case, is to actually improve the practices adopted by our, our portfolio companies uh, through our, our engagement with them. And, and, and we make sure that we are very transparent about it, that actually we report on these targets every year and that it's in our stewardship's uh, uh, report. And, and you know, uh, as I said before, we have 34 billion in, ass in low carbon assets. And, uh, you know, we, we have like, just give you an idea, of what we have, uh, we have we're very strong in transportation in Spain and Australia and Canada. We in Canada, this is a, a very interesting point because that's a differentiator from for La Caisse and other uh, institutional investors. We are financing, designing, and building a clean uh, light rail system in the Montreal region, and uh, and so uh, this is this is important because. Actually, this is a model that will probably be able to actually, to some degrees, maybe not as the entire thing, but to actually use that precedent to actually use that in the in to actually de develop further uh, opportunities around the world. And there are many jurisdictions that are looking at this model and looking and asking us how we're doing it. And um, the part, but that presents a partnership with the government that is different. Than, than, than what was done before. So we need, and it, that's the link with the UN. You know, the UN before, I, I was on the UN ICE before, and it's all about creating new platforms and new ways of interacting the private sector and government uh, at the, you know, to actually make sure that capital is better aligned with sustainable development. Well, it's a bit the same thing here. It's, it's just more micro and applied to specific projects. And so, uh, you know, this is this is how the case also became the number one in the world in renewables, basically. Um, and we have, you know, close to thir 13 and a half billion dollars in, in renewable. Uh, and uh, we have 900 million dollars in green bonds. So these are all examples. And uh, in fix income, we have, uh, you know, the, in Barcelona, we, 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 we lent money to refinance a public private partnership contract to build and operate metro stations in Barcelona. And so uh, this is the this is these are examples in Australia. We are investing as part of a public-private partnership for trains and systems and operation and maintenance of the the Sydney uh, the Sydney Metro system, the largest uh, public transit project in Australia. So we believe that actually 
the big that the opportunities where the best returns and, and consideration of the risk will be that sort of opportunities when we're talking about infrastructure and the likes. I'd just like to remind our audience that if, if you can submit a question on the right hand side of your of your screen if you have a question for our guest. Um, uh, let's talk briefly about globalization. You spent four years at the UN. Now you're responsible for a collection of offices around the world. Um, uh, some people think that globalization is, if not dead, at least on the wane. Is it? I, I am not a believer. I know I'm a contrarian to a large extent on this, and this is my personal view. Uh, I, I think globalization is not over. I think maybe you could have globalization, that's as some people are talking about. I think, um, you know, um, there will, this is, this. look at the supply chain. The supply chains are all, uh, you know, integrated together around the world, and that will remain. There will be some regionalization of supply chains in some specific areas where it's of national interest or regional uh, interest uh, because of the politics of it. Yes, there will be some of that. Uh, there will be some, uh, you know, like uh, enhanced focus uh, nationally and regionally in the Americas, for example, about do we have in the Americas you know, the essential supply chain that we need. Yes, people will look at that regarding, regardless of the result of the election on November 3rd, but, but I, that will not stop globalization. In some corners, it's going to be a different kind of globalization, uh, but uh, I, I actually believe the interdependence is there and it's so deep that actually we, and look at the main challenges we're facing in the world. What are the inequalities and climate change? These two uh, challenges need, what, do, what is the answer to this? It's a massive build of infrastructure all over the world. And no country either acting unilaterally or bilaterally or and no company, no investor can do it on its own or its own. And, and so you will need the multilateral arrangement, the multilateral platforms. They may be subsets of the big multilateral um, tools that we know and that we have, but, but still, uh, we need to collaborate amongst ourselves and there's a role. And, and this is an opportunity for Canada. This is, there's a huge opportunity for Canada at the moment. I'm very bullish on Canada because in Canada, we have a lot of the talent uh, and a lot of the expertise that will be needed in the post-COVID world. And, and, and actually, we just need to be a little bit more audacious in the way we do it. And we need to create the platforms in Canada to actually develop some global strategy. And we need to work with each other and, uh, and develop the cluster properly and to actually um, you know, bring the expertise needed, whether it's financial services in some cases, the agro business, the all sorts of digital expertise, uh, the, 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 you know, the clean tech stuff. And, um, and I think pension funds are a part of that uh, ecosystem where we need to work with, with each other, but we also need to work with some better with some partners. And at La Caisse, that's the very interesting thing about the mandate of La Caisse. La Caisse is return to shareholders, and another part of the mandate is the economic development of Quebec. So I'm actually um, very surprised, uh, not so pleasantly surprised, and I knew it could be there, but how it easy it is to leverage the network of La Caisse for, for actually our Quebec partners to actually develop ex opportunities uh, abroad. And, and this is something that we need to do across the board in Canada and uh, all of us. And when we think about that, because if not, look at the geopolitics of this world. It's, you know, capital has a very big role to play in, in, in all of this. It's, it goes with the future of the planet and how we see the planet, but also the future uh, well-being of our own country. Uh, we've got a good question from the audience who noticed earlier when you were talking about um, international markets, you, you didn't really mention China and, and uh, your Asian hub is in Singapore, uh, not in Shanghai, where you also have an office. Are you less bullish? Is the case less bullish on China than on, uh, on some, of the, some of these other places? Well, I should have mentioned China. It's just my my own mistake. We have significant um, uh, investments in the in the marché boursier in the stock markets in China, 
and um, and uh, we have limited uh, private equity play there. But this is a market that we're looking very closely at the moment, and that uh, we will uh, increase uh, our, our likely increase uh, our investments in the in the midterm, near future to the midterm. And um, the other part that I wanted to talk about in the post. Uh, uh, pandemic situation and to the people that are on the call, I just want us to be careful about that. That has nothing to do with the question that was asked, but this is something I would, I should have mentioned uh, from my UN role, you know, and I just will want to leave you with that. In 2008, 2009, only uh, 24 countries asked the IMF for assistance because they were about to default on their, on their, on their uh, uh, financial situation. And just think about that now. There's more than 110 countries that already has, has asked uh, the IMF for assistance. So this is a, this is a major. Uh, this I don't know what will be the impact of that, but we. I just want you to be aware of that. I think it's an important point in a post-pandemic situation. It's a major event, and and uh, and I wish we could spend more time talking about it, but unfortunately we have run out of time. Mr. Blanchard, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Thank you. And uh, thank you to all the audience for uh, joining us for this uh, second day of Bloomberg's Canadian Fixed Income Conference. Uh, we hope you enjoyed uh, all the discussions. Thank you to our speakers and moderators uh, for the program. And of course, a big thank you to our sponsor, the National Bank of Canada, uh, without whom this event would not be possible. Um, please uh, look forward to having you up, up in our upcoming sessions for uh, for this conference. This is the second of six parts that we'll run over the next several weeks. Our next session is going to dive into the energy sector uh, from drilling to midstream uh, to power companies. And we'll also feature an interview with uh, Sophie Brochu, the uh, CEO of Hydro-Quebec. That all begins on Tuesday, October 6th at 11.30 a.m. Eastern time. And a reminder that for all of your financial and business news to Tune in to us on your terminal or Bloomberg.com and follow us on Twitter at Bloomberg.ca or at Bloomberg CA and at business. Thanks very much for your time.